Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, day two of the Kentucky Chamber's Business Summit and uh, annual meeting. Uh, I'm Bill Goodman. Once again, I'll be with you uh, throughout the, uh, the day. Uh, we'll try to keep um, all of the events uh, moving. Uh, we appreciate uh, all of you uh, being here uh, bright and early. Everybody have a great time last night. Enjoy the dinner and Chuck Todd's remarks. You know, I was going to, um, I don't want to steal uh, Elizabeth McCoy's line here because I think she's going to say something about it, but I, I, I got up really early this morning and I started writing a, uh, a blog post and, and I got as far as the title that Chuck Todd left his remark on Kentucky last night. I don't think any of those uh, will, will forget uh, that line. That was, uh, that was hilarious. But don't you think he recovered really well? <laughs> Send him a nasty uh, email or something. I mean, you, know, you can do that. Uh, this morning, we'll begin with a discussion uh, with uh, Toyota's uh, Will James about the auto industry and Kentucky's economy. But again, uh, before we uh, get started and before Will comes up to the podium, Elizabeth McCoy. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Bill. And I'm add my welcome. And this old white woman will try to do her best. <laughs> I'm telling you. He uh, Chuck told uh, Jim Ford last night that he was actually glad that that happened because he realized that everyone was listening. And Jim said, and you thought that we were going to pay you to come here and we weren't going to listen to you, really? So anyway, um, we have a great lineup today, as, as you know, and as uh, Bill's already indicated, and I'm ex especially excited to be here with my friend Will James and uh, hear about Toyota because he's the incoming chairman uh, of this Kentucky Chamber of Commerce as you know and we recently had our Kentucky Chamber Board meeting in Hopkinsville and Will was so very generous with his time uh, with my first grader who's very interested in cars and Will sat on the floor with Griffin and explained to him how many we assemble and how fast they go and what all they do and it was it was really really nice uh, Will and Griffin especially said, please tell Mr. James hi. So, hi. We're also going to hear from uh, our, cha our Chamber President and CEO, Dave Atkinson, who's going to discuss our community's vision for Kentucky over the next several years. And he's also going to briefly discuss the Chamber's recent update to the 2009 Leaky Bucket Report. You have that updated report in front of you on the table today. You may remember that it was a groundbreaking report where we called, uh, we found that spending on corrections Medicaid and public employee health insurance were growing at a rate significantly faster than the overall state budget. A 2011 update has found some substantial progress, but we still have uh, a lot of work to do and we wanted to update the report to keep us focused on the, the issues in front of us. So we have a lot to cover today and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Kentucky One Health they are the, going to introduce the f first speaker today, and uh, the first her, the person from Kentucky One is Sherry Craig. She's the Vice President of Ad Advocacy and Public Policy. In her multiple roles for Kentucky's largest health system, Sherry is responsible for the development and implementation of the organization's engagement strategy with government officials, regulatory agencies, and key policymakers. Additionally, she cultivates philanthropy for the six hospital foundations to support medical research, capital improvements, access to quality health care, and scholarships for health care professionals. Please join me in welcoming Sherry Craig. Thanks, Elizabeth, and good morning to everyone. As many of you may know, Kentucky One Health was formed in 2012 when Jewish Hospital and St. Mary's Healthcare and the St. Joseph Health System came together. And in late 2012, the organization formed a partnership with the University of Louisville Hospital and the James Graham Brown Cancer Center. Together as Kentucky One, we are now working toward the common goal of bringing wellness, healing, and hope to all, including the underserved. Kentucky One is a young organization, but with a long history and a large role in providing health care in the state, with more than 200 locations, 13,000 employees, and a medical staff of more than 3,600 physicians. Disease prevention is at the core of our mission, and we are expanding access to care and implementing new programs toward that end. 
we are enhancing our commitment to population health approach to health care. Simply put, that means we work more closely with patients and their loved ones to help them make better decisions about how they care for themselves, how they can stay healthy, and how they can make better use of health care services. It's fitting that I have the opportunity to introduce our morning keynote speaker, Mr. Will James. The first time I met Mr. James was when Our Lady of Peace, which is a psychiatric hospital primarily serving children and adolescents, won a Toyota van through Toyota's 100 Cars for Good program. It really is a generous program. In July 2010, Will James became the seventh president of Toyota Motor Manufacturing Kentucky, Inc. As such, he leads Toyota's largest automotive manufacturing plant in North America, while also championing quality initiatives for Toyota's 14 North American manufacturing operations. Mr. James is the first African American to serve as president of Toyota's Kentucky plant, which manufactures the Camry, America's best-selling car, and was recently named the new home of the first U.S.-produced Lexus. Mr. James's career with Toyota began in 1987, supervising a team of about 20 employees. He has since served in multiple leadership roles within Toyota's network of manufacturing operations around the, the, across the United States. Please help me to welcome Mr. Will James to the stage. Good morning. I, uh, first of all, would like to thank Sherry for that uh, introduction, but uh, also I'd like to thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth mentioned that I had an opportunity to spend a few moments with Griffin. Uh, what she didn't mention was Griffin did more instructing than he did listening. Uh, Griffin had already prepared a list of the 10 fastest cars in the world, and I was uh, a little bit surprised uh, about four of them on the list. So I went back and did a little bit of research myself, and he was absolutely correct. So I'm looking forward when Griffin comes out to the plant, we can show him uh, firsthand. But uh, for all of you this morning, I appreciate you being here. Uh, first of all, let me say, um, I hope that you didn't spend too much time out uh, after dinner last night. But for those of you who did, and for those of you who may not be morning people like me, here's a little known fact that'll get your blood flowing. Here in Kentucky, manufacturing is the number one economic driver. Now, how many of you knew that? Okay. okay. You know, when you think about it, it really should come as no surprise. The manufacturing industry has played such a vital role in our nation's history, and it's been the backbone of our economic growth. It's made things possible for so many families across this country, pulling many of them out of poverty and into the middle class and beyond. And manufacturing remains a hugely significant part of our nation's gross domestic product for the simple reason that we will always need people who make things. Now, according to the Manufacturing Institute, uh, American manufacturing directly employs nearly 12 million men and women and supports an additional 5 million more jobs. And another surprising fact, the average compensation of manufacturing employees is 19% higher than workers in non-manufacturing industries. And all of this is to say that with over 2,400 manufacturing facilities located across the great state of Kentucky, supplying more than 235,000 full-time jobs, I think Kentucky has a lot of reason for optimism, both today and tomorrow. And it's against this backdrop that I'd like to share several reasons why we at Toyota continue to be optimistic about 2014 and why we believe that our industry's future as well as our company's future in the state of Kentucky and beyond is bright. So let's start at the beginning. Our state's automotive manufacturing his history actually dates back about a century to the Model T. Now obviously a lot has changed in the car business over the last 100 years. In fact, a lot has changed since I joined the business back in 1987. But back in 87, when I joined Toyota, about a year before this first Camry came off the line, I was one of the first 300 people hired. 
And today we have a team of about 7,000 directly employed at our plant in Georgetown. Now when you take into account our 23 dealerships across the state plus 100 local suppliers, Toyota's employment in Kentucky is around 21,000. Now that's a significant footprint, but that's just Toyota. According to the Kentucky Cabinet of Economic Development, when you look at total auto-related jobs in our state, Kentucky ranks third in the U.S. with over 82,000 people employed. This number includes jobs created by four auto assembly plants, for us, Toyota in Georgetown, of course, the two Ford plants here in Louisville, and General Motors down in Bowling Green, plus jobs created by nearly 460 other motor vehicle related establishments statewide. Now what's the reason for all of these jobs? Folks, Kentucky is one of the top vehicle produce producers in this country. In fact, last year our state ranked third in light vehicle production with over 1.2 million vehicles produced here. And I'm proud to say that over a half of a million of them were Toyotas built at our plant in Georgetown. But another way to look at it is one in, more than one in, in 10 cars and trucks sold in the US in 2013 was made here in Kentucky. Now, I mentioned earlier that I joined Toyota as one of the first 300 hired. And we recently had a gathering where I was able to reunite with many of the people who came on board with around the same time that I did. And believe it or not, you know, two thirds or 200 or so of them are still, are still at it. But funny story, the job that I started with was not the job that I was originally offered. My background is mechanical engineering. I absolutely love the field. I'd had the opportunity to work in engineering for nine years prior to Toyota. I came here for the original opportunity to interview for a job in engineering. But as we were having the interview and they were sharing with me a lot of the management practices that Toyota has, I became pretty intrigued. And as a matter of fact, before the interview was over, I started talking about supervision more than I started talking about engineering, hoping that they got the hint. At the end, I mentioned that I was interested in supervision and really interested in working with Toyota here. Uh, however, uh, when I got back home and a couple of days later, they gave me a call and they offered me a position. They offered me a position in engineering. I thought about it for just a second. I said, you know what? I really want to work for Toyota. I am very interested in your company, but I'm really serious about management. After I went back home, I had an opportunity to pull up a little bit more information on Toyota. I got more and more intrigued about that idea of management, the Toyota way, and I wanted to learn it from the best. So I said, thank you very much. I really would like to work for Toyota, but I really am interested in management. I'm gonna have to turn down the job. I hung up the phone immediately. I thought that's the stupidest thing you've ever done in your life. <laughs> that doesn't make any common sense at all. You gotta get in before you can make a change. You don't make a change on the phone. You know, I'm, I, I'm running myself crazy with this thing. But fortunately, a couple of days later, they realized the mistake that they made, and, <laughs> and they called me back. So, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, everything worked out then back in 1987, and it all started from there. I did start as a supervisor, we call a group leader, first line supervision uh, there back then. But as part of my orientation, and all of the new employees' orientation back then, we spent a month on the line, well, we spent a month orientation in Japan. And most of the folks that were there spent their entire month on the auto assembly line getting a feel for you know, auto production so that they could come back and emulate that here. Fortunately for me and for I think many of our customers, I only had to spend one day on the line. And folks, I gotta tell you, I have tremendous respect for the people that we have that's working on the assembly lines in the auto industry. And I'm someone who spent a lot of time tinkering on cars over the years with, with my dad. But uh, you know, just spending that one day on the assembly line forged my respect for our team members who do it every day, forever. 
So take it from me, the fact that more than one in 10 of every vehicle sold in the US was built in this great state of Kentucky, I think says a lot about our state. I think it says a lot about our people. And I also believe it says a lot about our future. So what does the future of the automotive industry look like in Kentucky? Well, obviously we don't have a crystal ball, but we do have some very good indicators to point to. And folks, the signs are truly positive. And the first sign is growth. I want you to think about this. Over the last five years, the Cabinet for Economic Development says that there has been approximately 285 new auto industry location or expansion announcements in Kentucky. Now these represent 17,000 new jobs and nearly $4 billion in new capital investment. And last year alone accounted for more than $1 billion in investment and nearly 4,000 additional jobs in our industry. Another favorable indicator is the U.S. sales forecast. Now, analysts predict the range between 16.2 and 16.4 million vehicle sales for the industry in 2014. And to put this in perspective, auto sales before the recession were running about 16 to 17 million. But the past two months of May and June, the industry saw its best results in nine years. And I'm happy to say that if we keep this up, we'll soon return to the sales rate comparable to pre-recession days. We're actually right there in the zone right now. But we actually expect more than 400,000 more customers than last year will lease or buy a new vehicle in 2014, which means the auto industry should grow for the fifth consecutive year. Now, there are a number of reasons for this historically low interest rates, and even more potential customers. Analysts say that U.S. buyers aged 35 and younger will be a key contributor to industry's growth, continuing the trend that we've seen the last few years. For example, I'll just pull a snapshot out of here. From 2009 to 2012, vehicle sales to those born after 1980. Now, I'm not going to get into the older comments and things from last night. I'm going to stay away from Chuck Todd. But vehicles, you know, sold to folks born after 1980, more than double, from 1.2 million to 2.5 million. And sales among this same age group increased another 20% from 2012 to 13 are in, and are expected to increase another 10% this year to around 3.5 million vehicles. That's folks born after 1980. Now this is particularly relevant for us in Kentucky because the Camry, our highest volume unit, is gaining popularity among younger buyers with the average age of the current Camry buyer down by about 10 years. So overall at Toyota, we estimate our 2014 U.S. sales will increase by about 25% of that 400,000 or 100,000 vehicles to 2.3 million. And with America's best-selling car built in Georgetown, that's good news. That's good news for our local manufacturing operations, especially when you consider that 2013 was one of our highest volume production uh, years on record. So as you can see, the future of the auto industry is bright, possibly brighter than ever. But also on the horizon, is some very inspiring technology initiatives. Now, every automaker is contributing new ideas and technologies to meet the needs and desires of our customers both today and for the future. And that makes now a very exciting time for our industry. For instance, I want you to imagine a car that travels over 300 miles on a single tank of hydrogen and has zero emissions. Well, actually, maybe that's not absolutely correct. The emissions is water vapor. 300 miles, one tank of hydrogen, water vapor. That's the car of the future. And the car of the future is now. Now, this is the Toyota fuel cell vehicle. 
This is a hydrogen fuel cell sedan that comes to market next year. And we believe that it will be the flagship vehicle that moves the industry to a new era of sustainable mobility. Imagine vehicles without gas and without emissions. I'm talking about full circle. I actually studied fuel cell when I was back in college. But back then, I never expected to see this type of technology hit the road as an electric drive, mid-size, great-looking four-door sedan. So as Yogi Berra might have put it, the future ain't what it used to be. Now, while we're excited about the fuel cell vehicle, this is just a part of what we see as future mobility. Take a look. Some pretty cool stuff in it. Now, this is not exactly the Jetsons, but we're getting there. <laughs> you know, some of this may seem out of reach, but when I think back to 1988, when that first Camry came off the line in Kentucky, we were building only about a handful of cars a day, and they all looked just like this one. Same color, same options, exactly like this one. But nearly three decades later, we built more than 10 million cars in Georgetown. And that 10 millionth Camry on the right is a Camry hybrid. Now I point this out because 30 years ago, we never dreamed of building a hybrid in Kentucky. Toyota was just starting to talk about hybrid technology. But in 2007, we became the first Toyota plant outside of Japan to build a hybrid vehicle. And today we're building Camry and Avalon hybrid models. And all of this is to say the technology of tomorrow is within our reach. And who's to say we won't be building what you saw in that video Sunday in Kentucky? And I'd like to think the possibilities are endless. But thinking about tomorrow also means thinking about who's going to envision and create the cars of the future, as well as who's going to create and maintain the environment in which these vehicles are manufactured. Now, with that being said, workforce development is something that we're focusing on in Georgetown as well. And it's why we're creating next generation programs like the AMT program. Now, the AMT program stands for Advanced Manufacturing Technician. And it's a program that has proven to be an effective recruitment and development tool for our, us at our plant in Kentucky and more manufacturing plants around the U.S. are joining in on this initiative. It's a partnership with BCTC that is designed to give students the option of a more focused education that prepares them for a career in manufacturing. Graduates of this program have gained many of the life skills, the technical knowledge, and the workplace experiences necessary for a successful career in manufacturing, acquired through five semesters non-traditional instruction, including classrooms that mirror the assembly environment. Now we combine this with actual work experience from day one of the program, and the result is more manufacturing jobs filled and more graduates gainfully employed. Now this is a win-win for the students and the industry, especially when you consider that an estimated 600,000 skilled manufacturing jobs are expected to go unfilled this year. Folks, we're talking about jobs from 70,000 up to $110,000 a year. 600,000 are 
expected to go unfilled because we don't have the skilled members to be able to, to fill them. So at Toyota, we believe in the power of teamwork. And we believe that this collaboration or this type of collaboration and tackling issues together rather than silos is really what we need to move the needle in this critical area of our business. And that's why we're all so excited about Kentucky's newly created Automotive Industry Association. Now, since it creates a unified voice for the auto industry, we'll soon be in a much better position to team up to address the challenges, the solutions, and also the opportunities of our industry. And at Toyota, we look forward to working together with other automakers, as well as auto suppliers, to advance our industry now and into the future. And speaking of what's to come, I'd like to now share with you a few things that I'm excited about specific to Toyota's future in Kentucky. And top of the list is the 2015 Camry. For the past 12 years in a highly competitive market, our Kentucky-built Camry has been America's best-selling car. In fact, in the month of May, nearly 50,000 Camrys hit the road in the U.S. Or another way to look at it, Americans took home a Camry every minute, no, actually, every 54 seconds. And that's as fast as we can build them at our plant in Georgetown. And this year, I'm excited to say that we made Camry even better. Take a look.
You know, you probably uh, don't expect people to talk too much about uh, cars and emotional appeal. But in my business, that's what we do. And I really do feel that with this car. And I mentioned earlier that we sold 50,000 cameras in the month of May. And that's, pretty, that's a pretty amazing number. But when you consider that we actually showed the world the 2014 Camry in April, so people saw what the new model was going to look like. One month before, they went out and bought 50,000 of the current. That's, that just doesn't happen a lot in our vehicles, or anybody's vehicles. But with Camry, 90% of the new sheet metal, a more muscular and aggressive exterior stance, a refined interior with upgraded materials, and a wide range of wheels, tires, and accessories to dress it up and make it your own. Now, I noticed one of our suppliers, uh, Ed, Ed Rigo, and his team from Innova Premier are back there in the back, and they'll be providing a lot of these wheels and tires and get you some rest. We got a lot of cars to build. You heard it from our team. Inside and out, America's favorite car is better in nearly every way. And best of all, it's built by people right here in Kentucky. This is a mega change for Camry and the most extensive mid-cycle change in our company's history. Look for it on the road this fall. We actually start producing it on September the 7th. Now next year is going to be a big year for our plant too and for our company because next fall we'll make history again as we begin production of the first Lexus model built in the U.S. Now with this project, we're investing $360 million in our plant. We're adding an additional 750 jobs, and we're increasing our annual production by about 50,000 vehicles a year. Now if you crunch the numbers, this increase should help Kentucky to move closer to that number two spot just behind Michigan in light vehicle production. But I have to also point out that at our plant in Georgetown, we make so much more than cars. A lot of people don't realize it, but we make about 40, I'm sorry, a lot of people don't realize, but, but we also make replacement parts to the tune of about one million a month. These are hoods, fenders, trunks. We manufacture over half a million engines per year in Georgetown. And we also supply sheet metal parts to our plant in Indiana, Canada, Mississippi, and Texas. In fact, Toyota's plant right here in Kentucky is one of the largest, most dynamic manufacturing operations in the world. And in 2013, the third highest vehicle producer among all Toyota plants globally by only about 3,000 units. Now, all of this is to say that the Kentucky plant is considered the flagship plant. And once we get the Lexus online, we will clearly be Toyota's largest manufacturing site in the world. And over the next couple of years, we'll also be strengthening our technological leadership. Now, I'm sure some of you have some questions about, you know, what's going on with this uh, consolidation of the North American headquarters and the folks that are moving from Erlanger and so forth. And I, I'm going to touch on that a little bit now and be prepared to talk about it as much as you like during the question and answer session. But actually, as a result of this move, Georgetown gets bigger. Because as we move the consolidation of the headquarters, and that's our sales group out of California, that's our finance group out of California, some design folk out of uh, Michigan, very little, uh, folks out of New York, and then our manufacturing headquarters here out of Erlanger down to Texas. Um, we're gonna, we've made the conscious decision that since, since Georgetown is the largest plant, we're gonna move all of the production engineers into one central site here, here in Georgetown. Now let me touch again on this uh, consolidation. Uh, most companies, globally, 
have a central headquarter. But because of the way that Toyota actually came to North America, we never did. Our first, our sales group came over. They were housed in California because it made sense. All of the cars came from Japan. They came through the Long Beach port. Them being in Torrance, California, made a lot of sense. After that came the uh, R&D up in Michigan. And then later came manufacturing. First wholly owned plant here in Georgetown. Uh, so after Georgetown started producing, Canada came on board, our Indiana plant came on board, there was a decision that we needed a manufacturing North American headquarters as well. So it was built in Erlanger. What this consolidation does for us is it takes the sales, the manufacturing, our folks out of New York and all of them down to one central location down in Plano, Plano, Texas. Again, it makes perfect sense. And one of the questions I get asked a lot was, was Kentucky not competitive? You know, wh why, why wasn't the North American headquarters housed in Kentucky? And folks, uh, you know, the, the truth of the matter is, Kentucky was not considered. It wasn't a matter of competitiveness. Kentucky was not considered, California was not considered, New York was not considered, Michigan was not considered. And this was the thinking way. We're going to be moving four different entities of our North American operations to one common place, and we want a new corporate, North American corporate culture. We thought the best way to do that was to find a different location for everybody. Everybody had some shared sacrifice going into the new central headquarters. Had we tried to talk everybody to go in California, that might have been a rub. Had we tried to talk everybody to go to New York, that might have been an issue. You know, you can't build a new culture when you don't start with new beginnings. So the decision was to make new beginnings. But as a result of that, as I mentioned, the North American Production Engineers Group will be coming here, and we'll be building a whole new state-of-the-art facility on our campus just to house these, these engineers. This new investment will be on top of the current investment in Georgetown, which is valued about $6 billion. And the 300 engineers will soon be added to our workforce. Uh, that'll bring our overall employment number in Georgetown to over 8,000. So earlier I mentioned that we built about uh, a million Toyotas in Georgetown last year. But not all of the cars that we build here stay here. And actually, I got a chance to see this firsthand last year while we were in Dubai, uh, where we had a chance to see some of our Avalons that had been offloaded at, at a dock over there. But Toyota now exports to 32 countries. And in 2013, one in every 10 of our US produced vehicles was exported, or about one every 10 minutes. And our Kentucky built Camry, Avalon, and Venza all among Toyota's exported models. And in fact, we ship Toyotas from Bluegrass to as many as 12 countries worldwide. And with both Camry and Avalon among the top 10 American-made vehicles, it's something that we can all be proud of, you know, Kentucky proud. So for us in the automotive industry, Kentucky is a great place to be. And for all Kentuckians, that's good news. Because with industry-related jobs and investment on the rise, and all signs pointing to sustained growth for 2014, on top of the automotive industry's already strong footprint in the great state of Kentucky, at Toyota, we are truly optimistic. We're optimistic about our future. We're optimistic for our industry. We're optimistic for our company. And we're optimistic for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And we hope that you are too. Thank you very much. As Will mentioned, uh, he would like to uh, take some uh, questions uh, from you, uh, some comments. And I know that uh, with all of uh, the information that uh, he imparted uh, today, uh, there have got to be a few of those, so please uh, use the mic in the center aisle and um, be thinking of some things that you'd like to talk to him about. 
Will, um, you covered a lot of territory there, all of it fascinating and interesting. I, I want you to talk a little bit more about um, the move from Erlanger and, and what uh, has been described uh, as the new corporate culture. And whether it's um, in Erlanger or in uh, Plano uh, or California, what do you see and what can, can you tell us about a new corporate culture that maybe some of these uh, uh, Kentucky Chamber members and company owners and employees uh, can, can be thinking about uh, in the future? Great question. Um, one of the things that spurred this decision making around the consolidation, and, and honestly it's something we've been talking about in Toyota for quite some time, but one of the things that spurred it is that uh, we, we, we realized that we really needed to find a way to become more efficient and more effective in our communications. And if you can imagine, we've got 14 manufacturing plants around North America, that's not so unusual. But again, we've got a sales group in a completely different uh, location, we've got an investor group in a completely different location, a design group in, a, in another location, it makes it much more difficult for us to be able to communicate timely. We want to be a faster, more nimble, more communicative, more uh, aware uh, corporation. And we felt by, by bringing all of the North American headquarters together in one site, where you don't have to make a phone call, or you don't have to do an email, or you don't have to get on a plane you know, to California to go and talk about sales for next month. You walk over to the next room, or you stand up and you reach over to the next desk. So that's what we're all about. It's all about being nimble. And again, if you look at most major corporations, not only in North America, but globally, there's a central headquarters somewhere. We didn't have that. That's what it's all about. We hear a lot about um, the workforce in Kentucky. Sometimes, uh, uh, maybe most often, it's their negative comments. Uh, you referred to um, having uh, quality workers, uh, training those workers. I if you will, uh, talk a little bit about, um, about the workforce that is here, how uh, that workforce um, can be um, attractive to other companies looking at uh, Kentucky, and um, are we ready to, I, I think the governor said it yesterday, and we uh, often hear it said that you know, we're not going to have another Toyota. Uh, we're, not, uh, uh, we're not ready for that or, or whatever the reasons are. Can we have another uh, company uh, like a Toyota come in, like a Ford come in, or like a GE come in, and, um, and be that kind of uh, pie in the sky, a big idea that uh, might help us out of um, the economic woes that we have? Well, I, 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 certainly, I certainly don't have that crystal ball to be able to say but I, I can say that that is certainly, I think it's possible. You know, I, let me say this. Um, again, I came here 27 years ago, immediately started working from, from folks here from the local area in Kentucky. And I've had the, uh, the opportunity to work in a variety of different states across this country. And, and, I, and I, can, I can honestly say without a shadow of doubt, the people here in, in Kentucky are some of the most dedicated, sincere, knowledgeable, imaginative people that I have ever had the pleasure to work with. So I don't think that we have a problem with, with people in Kentucky. But at Toyota, we spent a considerable amount of time training and developing folks to be able to understand what it is that we do. I think many industries can put a little bit more time, including us, uh, put more time into training and development of the employees to make sure that they are prepared to do the things that are necessary. As I mentioned, the AMT program. The AMT program is not just for Toyota. Now we developed the program with BC2C at Toyota because we had the facility to be able to allow it to, to, to happen. We had some folks that could develop the training programs with the school to be able to make that happen. And we had the financial wherewithal to be able to support the program to get started. Fortunately now, the uh, governor and the legislature here in the state has approved a 
BCTC campus directly across the street for Toyota, which will allow us to not only bring more people through the program for us, but even as we've done on our site, we've invited people in from other plants as well. So I think the key is just training folks because they have the capability to do it, but training folks with the skills necessary to be able to do the jobs of the future. And again, 600,000 unfilled jobs. These are great jobs, 600,000. The people are there, the systems are there, we just need to train them. Uh, finally, if there's none of the question, uh, are you ready to uh, ride in one of those uh, driverless cars? <coughs> you, you see, I had to think about that for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready to give it a try. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about it in the parking lot. I'm talking about on. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm ready to give it a try. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, I haven't had the occasion to to fill that out, but I'm looking forward to, to a chance to do that. Now, I will say, before these cars hit the road, what wasn't said is that these cars, and this is being talked about around the country right now, these cars will be interconnected where they actually communicate with one another. They'll say, hey, Will is coming down the street to the right. You need to move over to the <laughs> left. And once, once they're talking to each other like that, then I'm ready to go. <laughs> but uh, but barring the communication between cars and lights and things like that, yeah, yeah I'll stay with my four wheels. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Will James, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Yes, sir. We are going to take a uh, quick break, 15-minute uh, break, uh, convene back here in just a few minutes. Uh, we want to thank uh, Kentucky Power for sponsoring uh, all of our breaks uh, during uh, the annual meeting. Uh, so relax, have a cup of coffee, cup of tea. We'll see you back here in a few minutes.